At 10, a tough first day back for the government after the summer recess, defending its handling of the controversy over crumbling concrete. Ministers say a list will be published this week of all the schools affected in England. The Education Secretary apologises after her frustration boils over. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that, no? She believes the number of schools with rack concrete is in the hundreds, not thousands. The crumbling concrete bubbling into a political mess without obvious end. It poses questions for ministers about their judgment, about their decisions, about their choices, about their attitudes to risk, now and in the past. Also on tonight's programme, Northern Ireland's Chief Constable resigns after a string of recent controversies. The White House says Kim Jong-un is planning to make a rare trip outside North Korea to hold talks in Russia with President Putin. And central Spain, like few, have seen it before. Three people have died after torrential rains. On BBC London, extending free school meals, secondary school pupils in one borough will now benefit. And cancer patients say getting a ULES refund should be easier. Good evening. It's been a testing first day back after the summer recess for the government, now mired in the controversy over crumbling concrete. Ministers say a list will be published this week of all the schools affected in England. As Rishi Sunak rejected claims, he oversaw budget cuts as Chancellor that meant rack concrete couldn't be replaced in as many schools as the Department for Education had wanted. It's also been a testing day for the Education Secretary, who had to apologise for her frustration expressed in salty language after being questioned over the government's handling of the situation. And remember, in the middle of all of this are thousands of children still unsure whether their schools will be fully open for the start of the new term. We'll talk to parents and teachers and analyse the finances around school maintenance and rebuilding. But first, Chris Mason at Westminster on the politics of crumbling concrete. You probably hadn't heard of it until the other day, but this stuff, concrete that can get crumbly, is building into a political mess. Did Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, walk away from repairs happening sooner? The man who used to be the Department for Education's most senior civil servant reckons he did. I was absolutely amazed uh, to see that the decision made by the government was to halve the, uh, the school rebuilding programme, down so, from 100 a year to 50 a year. The Chancellor, of course, was at the time. Uh, Rishi Sunak. The Prime Minister attempted to grip all this today by chairing a meeting attended by Cabinet Ministers and others, and he insisted afterwards he was proud of his record in his last government job. One of the first things I did as Chancellor in my first spending review in 2020 was to announce a new 10-year school rebuilding programme for 500 schools. Now, that equates to about 50 schools a year that will be refurbished or rebuilt. And if you look at what we've been doing over the previous decade, that's completely in line with what we've always done. Speaking to those who were involved in the internal negotiations within government at the time, the Department for Education did want more money for school repairs. The Treasury wasn't persuaded. But I'm told there were other bigger priorities then for education, not least the amount of funding allocated per pupil. This concrete wasn't regarded as dangerous then as it is now. It's the Education Secretary who's decided on the need for greater caution, but there wasn't much caution when she went all potty-mouthed after an interview this afternoon. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that, no? It turns out, no, not really. A few hours later, a new outfit and a rather different tone. I'd like to apologise for my choice language there. That was uh, uh, unnecessary. But it was an off-the-cuff remark, basically, you know, based on the interview. The interview had been pressing me quite hard, you know, why I hadn't uh, solved this issue, which had been going on since 1994. Um, and, uh, you know, it is frustrating because we're doing everything now to take a leading position, to be on the front foot. 
But the consequence of that is schools like this one in Eltham in South London having to close the gym, canteen and toilets. Obviously what's now been said shows the extent to which uh, there is, um, you know, this passing the buck within the cabinet. Is Rishi Sunak strong enough to do anything about it? I doubt it. For some pupils, parents and teachers, it isn't going to be the start of the new term they expected. Chris, this is a controversy decades in the making since we were all wearing bell-bottom trousers in the 70s. One wonders how much of a problem this is for this government as we speak now. Speak for yourself, Clive. Uh, yeah, it is a, it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one for exactly that reason. I've been trying to unpick, if you like, the anatomy of this row today to try and understand where it's come from and where it's going to. I know you're going to be talking to Faisal in a little bit about the bigger picture uh, attitude that this government and its Conservative predecessors over the last decade have had as far as spending is concerned. But on this particular one, there has been a tension between the Department of Education on the one side and the Treasury on the other about the allocation of money for school repairs. But, as I briefly mentioned there, the Department for Education a couple of years ago, I'm told by senior figures, was also concerned about things like free schools, things like uh, the spending allocated per pupil. And at the time, the perception of risk, as far as this concrete is concerned, was much lower. There was an awareness of it, but it wasn't as big a deal as it is now. And what happened over the summer is that there were incidents brought to the attention of the Education Secretary, and that led her to change her outlook fundamentally on risk and that's what's led to these headlines in the last couple of days. The question now is where it goes from here. We'll get that list promised by the Education Secretary this week as far as schools in England is concerned but there's far more public buildings than just schools. We've heard today uh, that court buildings built in the 1990s are all being looked at. Previous examination of court buildings, you guessed it, had looked at the 60s, the 70s when you were in those school trousers, and the 80s. The problem, in other words, has expanded, and there's every prospect this wider problem will continue to expand and so to con con continue to pose tricky questions for the government. Sure. OK, Chris, thank you for that. Chris Mason there at Westminster. Well, the Education Secretary says schools suspected to have rack concrete will be inspected within weeks, and she believes hundreds, not thousands, are affected. But around 1,500 schools have yet to respond to surveys on the extent of rack in their buildings, causing huge uncertainty for parents and teachers. Our education editor, Branwyn Jeffries, has that story. In Clacton-on-Sea, summer holidays are over, but three schools are delaying opening this week, leaving parents trying to sort out childcare. Duncan had just got back from holiday, but he's had to ask for tomorrow off work to look after his two children. It's just very frustrating that this has come right at the end of the school holiday, and it could have been avoided if the school had been informed at the beginning of the school holiday. The fact that apparently they have known that they've been a problem for five years, that all of a sudden now safety has been put first, which, which is wonderful, we're glad that it is. But that if there were questions five years ago, then really it should have been dealt with five years ago. His children's primary school had a survey done in July, but only last week did the government advice change. Just five minutes drive away, another primary school waiting for surveyors. Parents with children at the school unsure what happens next. Still don't know if properly, like down to the nitty gritty. Um, I just know part might part of the school might be cut off, but I'm not fully sure. So how do you tell if this is rack? These concrete roof panels will need to be checked by a surveyor. So the situation here is we actually don't know. Um, this area has not been um, surveyed, so we don't know whether or not um, there is rack present. Some classrooms shut until they know either way. Clayton High School in Suffolk has almost 800 pupils. Where rack is confirmed, the building is completely closed off. It's devastating. The start of a, of a school year should be about looking forward. It should be exciting. We should be celebrating the great results we got in summer, instead of which we're now kind of scrabbling to deal with just getting children back into school. So the term will start with remote learning for some year groups, while they try to get temporary classrooms on site. 
For Mighton School in Warwick, this is particularly hard to swallow. In a letter to parents, the head teacher says last year they put in a bid for the buildings to be rebuilt. They were told in December they were not in critical enough condition. One building has a roof with rack and the school now doesn't know if any of it can be used. This afternoon, the Education Secretary faced MPs for the first time on this issue. I'm confirming today that we will publish the list of the 156 schools with confirmed cases of RAC this week, with details of initial mitigations in place. In Scotland, some temporary classrooms are already in place. 35 schools now confirmed to have RAC there. Wales has identified two, while in Northern Ireland surveys continue. Schools are propping up ceilings, closing classrooms, still trying to get the term going this week in England, unable to tell parents how long it will take to sort this out. Yeah, our economic editor Faisal Islam is here, but first to Branwyn again. So, how long will it take to get these fixes all sorted out? Well, Clive, just the initial stages of this could last well into next year. So, first of all, they have to check the remaining schools. They're saying they're going to get surveys done within the next couple of weeks, but, of course, more schools could be added to the list. And then you're into the measures just to get by for the next few months, things like temporary classrooms. Well, in Bradford, parents have been told that two primary schools there may not get their temporary classrooms for two to three months. We know that a school in Essex that was due to get them for the start of term isn't going to get them until November, even though it closed in June. So there could be a very bumpy road ahead with children learning remotely or in temporary classrooms for many months, and that's before you even get to rebuilding and replacing roofs or buildings that have rack in them. So a lot of uncertainty. Faisal, is this all about money or is it about priorities or is it a bit of both? It's about both. Uh, there are two big factors in the background here. Whenever you have a problem in the public finances, the Treasury acts, it kind of swings first, really, towards what's known as capital spending, that's spending on buildings. That's because it can be, uh, these cuts can be made more quickly and in the short term at least they're seen as politically easier, though we may be testing the limits of that right now. So you've seen that trend after 2010, the coalition austerity that uh, these capital budgets came down and it's going to happen again after 2025. But within the capital budget, education used to be a much bigger priority. About one in eight pounds in 2005 in the capital budget was spent on education and now in the past couple of years it's been about one in 20 pounds. That's not the case for something like hospitals. Uh, and so you get these two effects hitting something quite unique, though, which is the fact that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, these construction techniques were used with a 30 to 4 year life, 40, 30 to 40 year lifespan. Mm. That's running out now. The bill for that is due. In fact, it's overdue. And it comes at a time when the capital budgets are going to be squeezed again, albeit after the next election. A challenge for whoever wins. Indeed. OK, Faisal, thank you. Faisal Islam and Brian Jeffries. Thanks both. Now, the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Simon Byrne, has resigned. He'd been facing calls to quit after a number of controversies in recent weeks, including an accidental release of details online on thousands of staff. Chris Page has that from Belfast. Are you going to resign today, Simon? Northern Ireland's most senior police officer had often been summoned for questioning recently, but today he didn't arrive at another emergency meeting of the board which held him to account. Simon Byrne had decided his time was up. I would like to record my thanks and appreciation to Simon for his work over the course of the last four years as Chief Constable. He is undoubtedly a dedicated police officer with a deep respect for the profession of policing. How can public confidence in the police service of Northern Ireland now be rebuilt? We have officers and staff who have been enduring, faithful, loyal, hardworking. We should never forget that. And they are there for our community. They've been here for the long term, short term, and have been through, through many, many difficulties. Officers and civilian workers have been dealing with an increased risk to their safety. Last month, details of all 10,000 staff were mistakenly published online. Detectives believe the information is now with dissident Republican paramilitary groups who continue to target members of the security forces. Last week, there was more controversy. 
A court ruled that two officers who carried out this arrest had been unlawfully disciplined because of pressure from the Nationalist Party, Sinn Féin. In his short resignation statement, Mr Burns said the last few days had been difficult for all concerned, regardless of the rights and wrongs. So the search is beginning for somebody new to take on one of the toughest jobs in UK policing. Being chief constable here means dealing with unique political sensitivities and security threats. The role will be all the more demanding after such a massive crisis of trust in the police's leadership. Chris Page, BBC News, Belfast. The White House says the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is planning to make a rare trip outside his country. He'll travel to Russia to hold talks with President Putin. Our North America correspondent Gary Donahue is live in Washington. Gary, China has long been Pyongyang's closest partner in the region. What's happening with the Russians? Well, this is about arms deals, Clive. This is about the Russians going international shopping for more arms. Uh, we know that they've already been taking delivery of drones from Iran to use in the war in Ukraine. And now they're looking for extra artillery shells and missiles from North Korea. It's not the first time that missiles and shells have gone from North Korea to Russia, but they were imported previously by the Wagner Group before the demise of Yevgeny Prigozhin. But this will be a, a high-level meeting between President Putin and President Kim Jong-un. Uh, they have met before in the eastern port of Vladivostok back in 2019, and it's thought that perhaps that may be the, the, the place where they'll meet again in the coming month. The, the Americans have warned that these uh, negotiations are actively advancing. And they've also said that they will pursue this at the United Nations because there are countless, countless security Council uh, resolutions and sanctions against North Korea that means they shouldn't be doing this. The other thing to take away from this, I think, is a sign that perhaps Russia, despite its military might, is running short of some of the things it needs on the battlefield. Clive. Indeed. OK, Gary, thank you. Gary O'Donoghue, they're live in Washington. Now, the Labour leader, Sakia Starmer, has reshuffled his top team ahead of the next general election. The deputy leader, Angela Rayner, is now also the shadow levelling up secretary, a position previously held by Lisa Nandy. She's been demoted to shadow minister for international development. And there's a return for some of those who served under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, including Hilary Benn. He's back as shadow Northern Ireland secretary. Our political correspondent, Ian Watson, is at Westminster. Any surprises in all this, Ian? No major surprises, Clive. I think what is interesting is, um, and lots of people were focusing on what would happen to Angela Rayner. She's undoubtedly done very well out of this reshuffle. But remember, just two years ago, when Keir Starmer tried to move her, there was an almighty fuss. Divisions were on display, but not today. Keir Starmer is saying that giving her a big job and also the title of shadow deputy prime minister is evidence of their strong and close relationship. But others who are broadly like Angela Rayner on the left of the party have actually been moved to the margins. And I think the prime example of this is Lisa Nandy, because when Keir Starmer first became Labour leader, he made her shadow foreign secretary. Now she's been demoted to shadowing just one bit of the Foreign Office international development. Meanwhile, those whose politics are closer to Tony Blair's or Gordon Brown's have either remained in post or they've been promoted. So, for example, if you're talking about surprises, potentially Liz Kendall, a stalwart of New Labour, is a new Shadow Work and Pension Secretary. But however talented his top team are, they've got one big task to convince people before the election they're not just an effective opposition, but they really are an alternative government. OK, Ian, thank you. Ian Watson there at Westminster. The government says it's exploring the introduction of a new rule on patient safety for the NHS after appeals from the mother of a 13-year-old girl whose death in hospital was preventable. Martha Mills died two years ago after failures in treating her sepsis at King's College Hospital in London. And now the Health Secretary Steve Barclay says he'll explore making it easier for patients to receive an urgent second medical opinion. Martha's mum, Mariopi Mills, has been speaking to Michelle Hussein. She had one of the world's greatest laughs, the sort of gift to the world, her laugh. It was the sort of laugh that was an invitation to be part of whatever she was finding funny. She was a 13-year-old full of promise and plans. But in 2021, Martha Mills fell off her bike and went into hospital. 
Her injury was treatable, but after she contracted sepsis, she deteriorated. The word sepsis was never used with us. We know now that the consultants were using the word sepsis amongst themselves. I said to the consultant, I'm worried it's going to be a bank holiday weekend and she's going to go into septic shock and none of you will be here. But I was just reassured again that this was just a normal infection. And so we weren't listened to and, I, and Martha herself was ignored. About five in the morning she needed the loo so she got up and um, she had a sort of massive seizure fit in my arms. Uh, it was horrible. <laughs> And um, when she came round, she lay on the bed and she said to me, it feels like it's unfixable. And of all the many things that went wrong, the thing that I find most unforgivable is that they left her so long. She knew she was going to die. Tell me about the change that you want to see, because you've obviously thought a lot about this. You've looked at what happens in other countries. You've looked at what happens in parts of the NHS today. Essentially, I would like uh, patients to have more power when they are in hospital because when you are in hospital, you are totally powerless. So the idea of Martha's Rule it, it effectively would formalise uh, the idea of asking for a second opinion she really talked about the future a lot. She talked about being a film director or an engineer or a writer. And I think about what she'd be doing and how much fun she would be having and how much fun she's already missed. Maropi Mills there speaking to Michelle Hussein. Well, King's College Hospital, where Martha was treated, says it's deeply sorry it failed her and has improved how it deals with parental concerns. A BBC investigation has found that five mothers have died after family courts allowed fathers who'd been accused of abuse to apply for contact with their children. Some of the women took their own lives. A separate study found that 75 children were forced to see fathers who'd previously been reported for abuse. Our special correspondent Ed Thomas reports. It's really bad. He's kept my child. It's killing me. The words of a desperate mother were calling Grace. They asked me to come home. Messages after the family court transferred the residency of her child to her former partner. I need to talk. I'm falling apart. We can't identify Grace. Family courts operate mostly in secret to protect the privacy of children and families. But we've discovered the man in her case was a convicted child rapist and the family court knew. He got custody. I'm like a puddle on the floor. Grace's friends told us she only found out about her ex's conviction after they met. She told me that she felt sick. Her world was just turned upside down. A short time later, Grace died. I'm unable to eat or sleep. It's a mess. Dead, dead, dead. I hate the family court. It was almost like they signed her death warrant, I think. Who did? The court. 100% the family court. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We've investigated the deaths of five women linked to trauma suffered inside the family court. We've spoken to friends, family, obtained coroner's reports and published family court judgments. Four of the women were accused of a disputed concept called parental alienation when a child rejects one parent because of manipulation by the other. One mother suffered the most horrendous abuse. She was raped, controlled. Her partner monitored her using CCTV in their home. She was accused of parental alienation and during family court proceedings, she took her own life. Parental alienation is used frequently, but it's been heavily criticized, especially in domestic abuse cases and we've learned the government is investigating its use in family courts. This is the national scandal of our time. Dr Elizabeth Delgano studied parental alienation claims against 45 mothers. She found 75 of their 77 children were forced into contact with fathers reported for abuse. 
credible evidence of abuse was diminished or ignored completely. I'm talking about uh, criminal convictions. So there were fathers who, who were convicted paedophiles. This is not a small issue. It is the biggest issue in my inbox. It's almost like they signed a death warrant, I think. Labour's Jess Phillips, Shadow Minister on Domestic Violence, is demanding urgent reform. The push on parent alienation is dangerous and it's harming children and women. The urgency of this is for governments to act on. It's a national tragedy and we just don't know it's going on. In a statement, the Ministry of Justice said the judiciary has issued new draft guidance for consultation on alienation claims and it had improved the family court to better protect domestic abuse victims. At Thomas, BBC News. And details of organisations offering information and support with domestic abuse are available at bbc.co.uk slash actionline or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 809. At least three people have died and three others are missing after record rainfall caused this heavy flooding in central Spain across Madrid, Catalonia and Valencia. Roads and train lines had to be closed and helicopters were sent to some areas to rescue those who'd scrambled onto their roofs to escape the rising waters. And check this, water flooding a metro train in Madrid from where Guy Hedgeco has the very latest. This weather event was a dramatic and deadly end to the Spanish summer, striking just as many people were returning to work after the holidays. The central province of Toledo was one of the worst hit areas. A man died after being trapped in a lift there, apparently because of the flooding. Another man was already dead when rescue services reached him near his car. Just west of Madrid, one man is still missing after his car was swept away although his 10-year-old son was rescued after clinging to a tree for eight hours. Just over a week ago, many parts of the country were seeing temperatures of up to 40 Celsius. Spain often sees heavy rain at the end of the summer, but this weather event, caused by a mass of low pressure, has been much more extreme than normal. In and around Madrid, where rivers burst their banks, flooding has damaged homes and left many residents struggling to keep the water out. 200 people were evacuated. The water came into the house as if it was a wave. It went upstairs and we panicked a bit. We tried to solve the problem as best we could. We put the dog on the roof. The flooding caused severe travel disruption, with an estimated 60,000 rail passengers affected. The high-speed rail link between Madrid and the southern Andalusia region has now resumed, but other services have been disrupted throughout the day. The extreme weather has now eased off. Guy Hedgeco, BBC News, Madrid. Jack Draper, the last British player in the singles at the US Open Tennis Championships, is out. It's his best run in the Grand Slam tournament, which finally ended less than an hour ago after a brave fight against the number eight seed. Here's Joe Wilson. Whilst his opponent here had just the same flair and rather more experience. Andre, a British player, led in the third. He had a break, but couldn't sustain it. Back came Rublev, decisive. Time now for a look at the weather. Louise is here. Hi there. Hi there. Well, it's all about the sunshine and the heat at the moment. In fact, temperatures today peaked at 30 degrees across England and Wales. And we haven't seen temperatures like that for quite some time. In fact, our highest temperature over the summer was 32 degrees in June. Can you believe it or not? But over the next few days, it's not out of the question that we could actually see temperatures peaking 32 degrees, maybe even higher, which would be a little bit ironic, wouldn't it, really, as September is meteorological autumn. But I hope you can enjoy it. I hope you like it as well. Sunny and warm for many. This is the story. We've got high pressure influencing the weather across us at the moment. Large area of low pressure sitting out to the west, and that's been bringing that unsettled weather across Spain that we've been seeing in the news just recently. But we are tapping into a southerly flow over the next few days. That's going to continue 
continues to drive up some warmth and increasing humidity as well. So as we start off on Tuesday, a little bit of mist and low cloud around, but a bit more of a breeze, particularly down to the southwest. So shouldn't be an issue. Lots of sunshine as we go through the day tomorrow. Generally, temperatures, again, similar values. We could see 28, 29, possibly a 30 degrees in one or two spots if the sunshine continues. Now, as we go through the evening and overnight, those temperatures are going to hold up. So it's going to be a beautiful start once again to Wednesday morning. Lovely sunrise, a mild start. And as we go through the day on Wednesday, increasingly hot and humid. Temperatures may well peak at 31 or 32 degrees by the middle part of the week. And it's a similar story as we go through Thursday as well. There is a possibility of triggering off a few sharp possibly thundery downpours out to the west as we go through the day on Thursday. These will be few and far between. On the whole, temperatures peaking at around 30 degrees once again. And that story continues next weekend. Clive. Few, what a scorcher. OK, Louise, thank you for that. That's it. More analysis on Newsnight just getting underway over on BBC Two. Victoria is standing by. But now the news continues here on BBC One as we join our colleagues for all the news where you are. Have a good night.